I see the King when He comes. Oh, we shall see the King. Hallelujah. We shall see the King. Praise the Lord. We shall see the King when He comes. He's coming in great power. We'll go to hell the blessed hour. Oh, we shall see the King when He comes. Are you ready? Should the Savior call today? Would Jesus say, well done, or go away? My home is for the peer. Love, I can never stay. Oh, we shall see the King when He comes. Oh, we shall see the King. We shall see the King. Oh, we shall see the King when He comes. He's coming in great power. We're going to hail the blessed her. Oh, we shall see the King when He comes. Oh, my brother, are you ready for the call? Crown Jesus Christ and Lord, Lord of all. Well, the kingdoms of this world shall soon before him fall. Oh, we shall see the king when he comes. Oh, we shall see the king. Hallelujah. We shall see the king. Praise Jesus. We shall see the king when he comes. He's coming in great power. We're going to hail the blessed her. Oh, we shall see the King when He comes. Oh, we shall see the King when He comes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Glory to God. Um. It's good to see Jerry Neal here today. He drove up here from uh, Georgia to, to go to the doctor at UT. He's uh, on dialysis, and uh, he got finally on a, liver, on a kidney transplant list in Georgia. And uh, so they recommended that he got, come up here at UT <clears throat> and, and try to get on the list there. So he got doctor's appointments <clears throat> tomorrow at UT. So uh, we want to pray for Jerry today for divine favor with these doctors. Um, there's a couple of possible uh, matches for a kidney, and uh, if that's where it has to go, then we pray for a speedy recovery. Uh, but I know that God could heal him. I mean, he could... Uh, uh, restore everything that Jerry's missing. Jerry had to have a, a leg amputated, uh, starting off with, with this diabetes and everything. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have um, to deal with this body. I mean, Jerry has, has to deal with his body. Many people, you know, you don't understand how that a man his size would have diabetes, you know. Um, I don't know the, the battles and the journeys that people have to go through. I mean, we're going to go through things because this body's going back to the dust. <clears throat> it's uh, <clears throat> like we read down in Sunday school. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3.19. The body's going back to the dust. So, you know, uh, spiritually he's strong, but he, he's not able to, in Georgia where he's at, to find a church that, that uh, is not so far away. He can't uh, physically drive to it with the limitations of his transportation. But uh, we need to pray for him divine favor. He moved to Georgia to, because his son encouraged him to, and now his son's moved to North Carolina. So, um, I, I pray God gets him moved back up here somehow or another. <clears throat> but
but uh, we want to pray for him before this service is over. Um, Tony brought me a, a paper. I was looking for him. I seen him outside there a minute ago. Maybe he'll come back in. Uh, uh, Tony got employed through the rescue squad to go door to door for donations and stuff for the rescue squad. I don't know if it's Blunt County, Knox County, or where, but so um, we want to pray for this person here. His name is uh, Everett Keaton. So we're going to hold him up in prayer. Uh, his uh, wife, I assume, uh, Tony was telling me, is, is he went in and said the woman had a box and she was just about to the point of breaking down in tears because she was so afraid that his sickness is going to cause him to die. And so Tony uh, took the name and everything to, to pray for this gentleman and, and her. And so his name, if you would, and you remember it, Everett Keaton. Um, so um, there are several things to pray about. I mean, is anybody here today don't need prayer? What is it, Edith? Who is? Who'd you say it is? A friend? A friend of Edith's on life support? I mean, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Denny. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> you know, uh, where would we be if we couldn't lean on Jesus Christ? I mean these these situations are dire. I mean they're they're really sub, they're severe situations. And uh I mean we'd be pulling our hair out if we didn't have the word of God to go to and his instruction to to bring our cares to him. He is our healer. He's our salvation is the most important thing. He's our redeemer. He's the, he's the reason that we can still get up in the morning and have that blessed hope. You know, I get up every morning. Uh, my hope is that trumpet will sound. Huh? That's my hope. It's a trumpet will sound. You know, but, but it's going to sound, you know, uh, for somebody right now probably. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when a saint goes on to be with the Lord, what's the Bible say happens? They throw a party for them. Huh? <laughs> huh? So if that person knows Jesus Christ as their Savior, the, the other side of their dilemma is a, is a heavenly party that we haven't even, couldn't even imagine the extent of. You know, so... Uh, we we can take courage in knowing that uh, today because one day it may be us, huh? And if it, and if we don't have that hope, then 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 there ain't gonna be nowhere to go. So, you know, we like I've been pushing on. We need to pray every prayer from the position of already having it. Paul said, uh, uh, speak things that are not as if they were. Huh? So uh, when we come uh, together and in unity pray for our lost loved ones, that's the most important prayer we can have. Is for that person that, that is our loved one or our friend or, or our acquaintance or even just the person on the street. 
Maybe the person sitting right beside you. Maybe that person sitting right beside you are struggling with whether they're ready or not. You know, I don't know. Maybe you don't know either, but, but God himself knows. And so pray for one another. Pray for one another. Pray for these we've spoken over here. Uh, Everett Keaton, uh, Edith's friend, uh, Jerry Neal, uh, others, uh, Gail's family, uh, Denny, Denny, okay, her neighbor, past neighbor. <coughs> I hadn't heard about that. Okay. Pastor in Pigeon Forge lost a hand. Okay. 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 Amen. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. No. Uh, a person without hope goes through depression. If, if they take courage in themselves like David did in the blessed hope, you know, God, God is, uh, God's for you. God is for you, church. He's not against you. He, he wants you to be successful. He wants you to be, most of all, spiritually healthy. You know, we're, we were spiritually dead, but God came, Jesus came, rose from the dead that we could be spiritually healthy. <clears throat> let, me, let me clue you in on something. <clears throat> let me clue you in. Just, uh, this is not a secret, but uh, it's really vital. Eternity is now. Huh? Don't forget that. Eternity is now. Heaven is now. Jesus Christ is now. Your victory has got to be now. You can't wait till then and walk into victory in Christ. And then the trumpet sound, and you go anywhere, you're going to be here to the end of the millennial reign, to the white throne judgment, if you do that. The most critical thing that anyone can do is, is accept Jesus as the payment for the sin debt <clears throat> and ask God to apply the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the only cleansing factor on the whole, in the earth at all, period. The blood of Jesus Christ. Not the blood of lambs, not the blood of goats, not the blood of calves, not the blood of anything but Jesus Christ. It isn't a, it isn't a, a category of who's, who, who, who has the, the most uh, uh, victories or who has the best testimony or who has that. Because it's, it's not a free gift to just the whosoever, just the ones that, that we think are doing good. It's a free gift to everybody. Huh? It's a free gift to everybody. Some people, a lot of people, reject that gift, though. They reject that gift. I mean, I hear people all the time. I was talking to a young girl here a while ago. Said, you know, that, that she's got a fiancé, and, and so he don't, he's not coming. So coming to church is not his priority. Serving God seemingly is not our priority, church. Because if our priority was serving God, wherever God called me to be in church, I'd be planning how I'm going to get here next Sunday. Huh? 
I would be getting all the barriers out of my way because my priority would be my relationship with my Heavenly Father all week long. I'd be planning on being here. I mean, because the devil's going to put things in your way. He's going to say, your neighbor's going to call. Hey, we're doing this Sunday. Would you want to go with us? We're going to the beach. Huh? Or your kids or your parents might be saying, Hey, we, we planned a family reunion, and it's going to be Sunday at 1 o'clock. Huh? I mean, the devil's already got a plan to keep you out of here. Huh? But you got to get all them plans that the devil has set before you out of your way to plan to be in the house of God. The Bible does say, as you see the end times approaching, fail not to assemble yourselves. Huh? I'm telling you, we call this, uh, th we call this the house of God, but actually this is the church. Jesus Christ rose from the dead and said, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my house on a rock. Huh? So he's building his house. He's building this house. He's building this house. Huh? See, the foundation of this house is not shaken. Because he's still getting up and carrying on. You might, you might redecorate the outside of the house, but the foundation is sure. It's Jesus Christ. And if anything else is built upon that foundation, it has to be Christ. It has to be Christ. It's the same thing as the Shumanite woman did to, uh, to, uh, to Elisha. The Shumanite woman seen Elisha, the man of God, passing by her house all the time. And the Shumanite woman went to her husband and said, didn't have no kids, but her, come to her husband and said, not for gain or nothing else. I just want to, I, I just want to uh, invite the man of God in, and I want to build a room on the top of my house. You see, I know it was the top because whenever the when when the promised son that that, that the, the prophet gave her uh, died in the field with the daddy, took him up into the upper room and laid him on the on the prophet's bed. Huh? So he's got to be the foundation and he's also got to be the head. Huh? So where does that leave us? Betwist and between. We're somewhere from the, the foundation to the head. We're somewhere there. If we're Christ. If we belong, it, it all, it's all about a seed. It's all about a seed. You see, in, in, in Genesis chapter 3 again, it says the seed, of, the seed of the serpent, the seed of Satan, and the seed of woman will have end of me against each other, but the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. Or Satan. So it's all about a seed. Is that seed been sown? Are you cultivating that seed? Are you praying that the Holy Spirit pours pours the the liquid in to to, to the seed that that the seed might flourish and bloom? Huh? Well, if that if that's so, then then the things that God promises through His Word. Is alive in you. That's all that can stand. These, I, I got. I don't know. I I just don't. I don't know if it's a. I don't know if it's a priority to you. I don't know if you've uh, learned that 
that it has to be a priority to you. I mean, it ain't flippant. It's not flippant. It's it's sure. God ain't God ain't looking for your opinion on how you would do something. He's not looking for it. He said, gather in his name, pray the prayer of faith, to gather in unity, he'll hear and grant the petition. Isn't that what he said? All right, are you ready to do that? Father, we just bind together right now. Lord, let us bring praise to you, Lord. Because we have a hope that's not uh, in the past. We have a hope that's right now. We have a hope that our spirit person is, is strong in the knowledge and in the, in the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The petitions that are brought before this church, we bring before you because there are needs in the physical realm. But, Lord, we pray for those that are lost and undone outside, outside the light of God. Lord, we pray right now that you'd bring them into the light. Lord, there's only two uh, scenarios of, of, of creation. There's two scenarios, Lord. You know that. There's light and there's darkness. And, Lord, we pray that we are able to bring these petitions into the light, into the light, into your hands, that you can speak over them healing, salvation, redemption, provision, whatever the need might be. But, Lord, most of all, we pray for salvation. Now, now we are. Now we're to be. Now we're to be your children, the children of light, not the children of darkness. Lord, we just put these things in your hands right now. We pray for your will to be done here today. Your will is that men everywhere, that men everywhere declare the works of God through Jesus Christ. The good news, the good news that salvation has come to man, people, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Sister uh, Carol up here, she has volunteered to, she wants to sing Praise the Lord and Amen. song <clears throat> and dance and shout. Woo! Glory! Woo! Whatever this morning. <coughs> My job of dancing. Come on, Carol. Bring Woo! Bring Glory. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. A stranger and a pilgrim, what it through this world below that yonder city, good Lord, and it's not not made by hands, got a mother, sister, and a brother. Have gone on before, and I'm determined to go and see them, good Lord, just over on 
that other shore I am a stranger and a pilgrim wandering through this world below I'm determined to go Going down to the river of Jordan Just to soothe my weary soul If I could but touch the hem of his garment Good Lord, I do believe I'd be made whole For I am a stranger City, good Lord, and is not made for hands. Well, I am a stranger and a pilgrim wandering through this world's land. Got a home in that yonder city, good Lord, and it's not not made by. Three hymn songs. Let's do Victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. What key was that in? I oh, know, but what key was that you just played? Uh, okay, I need it to be tenor, tenor and alto. Okay. We'll find you. How about some Victory in Jesus? Y'all got Victory in Jesus? Is me uh, humming. What am I up against? It's making it hum. Just fire away to glory to God. Keep your mind upon the Lord. Glory be to God. I heard an old, old story how Our a Savior, Savior came from glory. How he waited his life till Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his age still was atoning. And he said, he repented of my sins and gained the victory. Oh, victory! Jesus, my Savior forever, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power redealing, and he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and hear my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he is built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. 
And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. was uh, sitting back there, David was talking, and uh, this song coming to my head. So, if we can get it going. Y'all stand. This ain't going no sit down song. It's a praise. Yeah. Yeah, can only imagine when that day comes and I'm standing in the sun. I can only imagine how it will be when I'm face to face. In your glory, I can only imagine, I can only imagine, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel, will I stand for you Jesus? Oh, and all of you be still, will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. What it would be like by your side. I can only imagine how it will be when you're standing. I can only imagine, yeah. I can only imagine. My heart feel will I dance for you, Jesus? Or am I held to be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yeah, I could only imagine Surrounded by your glory 
what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Oh, and all of you be still. Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah, I could only imagine. I could only imagine I can only imagine Oh yes Can Can you see it can you see it? Can you vision it? Can you put it in the front of your mind? That's what we're working for. That, that, is, that is enough. That little bit. Enough. Like David said, put your priority straight. That is the priority. That's our priority. To stand there and see the man who took our sins on him who poured out his precious blood so that this man, imperfect, useless, could be made perfect. Thank you, Jesus. My personal testimony. I was raised on hymns. I remember most of the words, but then I get about three fourths of the way through and forget a word, so I'm gonna look at the words. So. We have nothing without His shed blood, but we also have nothing without His love. And that's you know, uh, what's the scripture say? Though I speak with tongues of angels and have not love. You don't have anything. You can take all your possessions and sell them and give them to the poor, but you don't love nobody. You don't have anything. So, all right. Love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, singing to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, Love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I cling. In his blessing stand with lift, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, misfits of his own. Faithful loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. 
He's the master of the sea, billows he will obey. He your savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Williams was a great singer and he had a great talent. Uh, he wrote several, several, you'd be surprised at the gospel songs that this man sung. This man was in a lot of pain too. I've, I've known about it for years, read books, magazines, records. Uh, he was, he come into this world as a child as he had a crooked spine and, uh, and uh, he had a lot of trouble out of it and uh, he had a lot of torment out of it, and uh, the doctors give him morphine, and 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 uh, he tried to soothe it and get away from the pain with uh, different things, and uh, such as alcohol. But uh, how many knows that uh, a drug like that and alcohol is just it means death sooner or later. But. Uh, well, he's in the hands of a just God, but uh, he had a great talent. If he'd just got to, if he'd just used it for God. But I don't know what that man went through. I know he went through a lot. He went through a lot of misery and hurt. And, and he sung, uh, they said he was in the back seat of the car and he was looking. He looked up over the back seat and they was looking. They was Back then, they used uh, for transportation. They ain't got all the things we've got. But he was in a car going uh, to a certain city, and they had got lost before the interstates come into existence, and just back roads. I remember the back roads, <laughs> gravel roads, no roads, mud roads, <laughs> ditches. And uh, But anyhow, he looked over the, over the seat, and he raised up from trying to sleep, and he said, I see a light, and uh, that light up yonder. Let's go to it, and it was a, it was a light from the city, and he got that song. I saw the light, and uh, this song was rejected and rejected and rejected from churches, but uh, he he wrote it for the glory of God, and anything can be used for the glory of God. Just lay hands on it, pray over it, sanctify it, Hallelujah, before God. I wondered so aimless I feel with sin I wouldn't let my dear Savior in Then like a God get back his sight Praise the Lord I saw the light I saw the light I saw the light No more darkness No more night now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Well, I was a fool to wander straight. When straight is a dead and narrow is the way. Now I have prayed it the wrong way for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Sing it. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night, now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside, praise the Lord, I saw the light, well I was a fool to wander astray, 
when straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Now I have prayed in the wrong way for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Well, I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to share something with everybody. I know a lot of you know me and a lot of you don't, but I've been around since a coon's age. So I just want to share because I know that there's so many people in this building right now that have kids that are on drugs and they're out there in sin. And we worry about them each and every day. And I want to give a praise report. My son... And, and most of you know him, Adam. He, he got on drugs, and he got really bad on drugs. And he lost everything. He lost his home. He lost his family. He lost his business. He ended up stealing and, and couch surfing. And he swore to me, Mom, I'd never do drugs in your house. But one day he OD'd in my bathroom. And, but by the grace of God, he was all but dead. But that day, he had his first true encounter with God. And all it takes is one true encounter with God to change your life forever. He went into a place called Crossville Bible Mission Training Center, and he was there for a year, and then he volunteered to go to Alabama to a place called Restoration Ranch out there where he is one of the counselors. But I want to share with you something that happened yesterday. Yesterday, he called me, and I could hear the hurt in his voice. And his ex had called up there and told him this big old mess and just tried to destroy. And, and, and I'm not, here's the thing. It wasn't her. It was the enemy trying to destroy what God is building, Okay. So immediately, I went into mama bear mode, okay? I was really upset. And so my son called me last night after I'd sat there and thought all these horrible thoughts about, I'm just going to go tell her off, and I'm going to blah, 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 blah. And so my son, this, this drug addict that OD'd in my bathroom, and this is how God works, he called me last night, and he said, Mama, I got something I got to tell you. He said, I went down there and laid down in my bed, and I was just going to wallow in a little bit of self-pity. And he said, God told me, no, you ain't, boy. You get up and you get up there and you call your mama because she's not handling this well. Amen. And she needs to be ministered to. And my son told me, Mama, it ain't about what anybody said. It ain't about you. It ain't about me. What it is about is how we react to every situation that the enemy puts before us. He said, we are ambassadors for Christ, Mama, and we have to show that no matter what. And he said, who's to say that God is not wanting to save this girl? And what she sees out of us and the way we deal with this is going to determine whether she's going to have that first encounter with God. So he said, instead of everybody being mad at her, please stand with me in prayer that she will have that true encounter with God. That just amazed me that God will take the worst of the worst and he will turn it around and use it for the best of the best. So here's my word to everybody that's got kids out there in sin and doing drugs and drinking or whatever they're doing. Don't ever give up. I never, ever, ever 
stopped praying for my son every single day. And one day I prayed the prayer, whatever it takes, Lord. And it took him overdosing in my house and putting everybody through that for him to have that encounter with God. So even when the enemy says, you've been praying for him for 20 years, well, it's time to give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Because Daniel, is, he, he is our lead. He started praying, and he didn't stop until the victory came. And when the victory came, he said, God sent an angel out the very first day you prayed. But the enemy stopped him, and he battled with him. That's what's going on with our kids. God hears our prayers, and he honors them prayers. The enemy's trying to stop it at all costs because when our kids give their life to God, that means their kids are going to give their lives to God. And they're going to, so many people are going to benefit from the fact that we as parents will not give up. Just wanted to share that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, the kids go to Sunday school. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You have a soundboard set up, brother? Huh? I'm a little bit loud. I'm trying to pull me down. Uh, you, you're good yeah, right good. there, I think. I think so. Yes. <laughs> Praise God. I'm speaking soft now. <laughs> <laughs> While the pastor's getting the board set up, I have a baptism certificate to present to Miss Regina Gale Whitehead. Please come forward. Now, you all know her as Gale. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says these words, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. On the third day of June, Gail was uh, baptized. So join me and welcome her into the house, in the family of God. Blessed Heavenly Father, we come before you again today. Thank you for this occasion to gather into your house and for those that have gathered. Lord, we thank you for your presence among us today. We ask you to bless this word that comes forward. We ask you to bless the tithing offering that came forward, Lord, and just to multiply it to meet the need of the hour. And all these things we give you praise and glory for, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you turn in your Bibles to um, John 14, <clears throat> praise the Lord. I was uh, just trying to remember. I preached a sermon one Wednesday night about about how fast the Earth was spinning, and I think it's based on Isaiah 24, uh, 25, where the Bible says that that the earth will shake and bobble like a drunkard and turn upon its top and, and how that that uh, I saw a news clip uh, yesterday it said the great wobble we're in it they said we're in this great wobble so uh, the the basis for what I was seeing was that uh, that um, you know in the Middle East um, there's wars I mean, they're not rumors of wars. There's wars. I think the calculation was about 800,000 Christians have been killed in Syria and Iran, Iraq. Not Iran, but Iraq and, and Syria. And, um, you know, 
they're in the they're in the heat of the battle, and we're protected by God's grace. You know, we're protected by God's grace. This this country was founded on the principles of the Bible. Founded on obedience to the Scripture. You know, there's a lot of controversy on, on everything as we begin. I mean, it's, it's the balance of light and dark. It's like we in the prayer, we pray to open in prayer. There's only two systems in the earth. And it's operating in the light or the darkness. Now, evil likes to operate in the darkness because they don't want people to see what they're doing. You know, darkness can be deception. So, deception is, is what Jesus warned us about, you know, in Matthew chapter 24, eight or nine times. He, he said, be not deceived. So, there is a great deception going on in the world. You know, uh... Pat has, has the Dawn of Victory service here at the church now on Saturday night at 7. And uh, Mike uh, Branham uh, is Mickey's brother that's in the Branham band. And he plays the keyboard and writes music. And he's an a educated man. He teaches music. Uh, he can play any instrument and everything. And so he's moving to, to um, Florida uh, the first part of July and everything. So uh, Pat invited him to bring the message last night, and, and and he he was led to bring the message of how that that the signs are in place for the last days, and uh, he uh, printed out this paper here. He printed out this paper and used these scriptures for his foundation a proof the Bible proves that we're in the last days. I mean, how many people believe you were in the last days? Ever, about about uh, unanimous. Everybody believes that we're in the last days before the tribulation. Huh? So, we are to be more interested if we do believe that. Now, we can say it and not believe it. If we do believe that, then we will care for our soul, for our spirit man. We will care what happens to it. We will. We'll care what happens to it. But you see, we can't do like Job. You know, we, we, we read the book of Job, we heard sermon after sermon after sermon on Job. You know, and Job starts out with the, with the counsel of God in heaven and, and, and the sons of God coming before the Ancient of Days, the Almighty God, and, and, and they're coming and they're interacting, the sons of God, the fallen angels, the angels, and Satan is there in the midst, you know, and it starts out... And uh, <clears throat> it starts out with God and Satan having a conversation. And the conversation goes like this. It says, God asked in Satan, so what are you doing? He said, I'm going to and fro in the earth. You know. And another one bites the dust. Huh? Huh? And so here, Satan is telling the Lord, I'm seeking who I might devour. And he hadn't changed his plan. He hadn't changed his agenda. He's still going to and fro in the earth, seeking who he might devour. And, and we're, so, we're so caught up in this message of grace, and the message of it's all about me, that we've made me the center of our universe. You see, uh, I thought about the book of Job a lot of times. And I thought how that, you know, the first thing that Satan attacked was his means of offering uh, a sacrifice to God. I'm getting a lot of whistle there. Can you work on that? I think it's the third button over. 
Okay, uh, but uh, so here uh, I've thought about it, and 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 we we see that Job went about his days sacrificing for his children's sake. In other words, he was doing right to get gain. Motivation. Motivation. Job was doing right to get gain. He was hoping to gain favor for his children, ten children. But when we get to a place that, that, that we're serving God just because he's God, then we'll get the message. Because Job lost everything, you agree? His, uh, his three friends came and, and, and they looked at Job's circumstances and they, and, and they surmised that Job had sinned. Job had sinned. Well, do you, have you considered the book of Job? Do you, do you see that Job was an upright man, righteous? Can you compare Job's existence to your own image in the mirror? I mean, can, I mean, we're, I mean, types and shadows is what the Bible's all about. If you don't understand types and shadows, you're not going to understand the message of the Bible. Because Ecclesiastes 1.9 says to think that there's not anything new under the sun. So it's a type and shadow. It's a type and shadow of things to come. Things that has been are going to come again. I mean, it's, it's apparent that, that, that people don't learn from experience their past mistakes. It's also apparent that, that uh, miracles don't convince people either. I mean, I've seen people that, that got healed of cancer. I've seen people that got healed of different uh, circumstances. I've seen people that were on their last breath. God turned around because of a faithful prayer uh, warrior coming in and anointing that person and them getting up and them them still not getting it because they continue to look at themselves as their center point you know if the message of the book of job is not apparent that 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 job said uh job's uh conversation began with God. He said, where were you at, God, when my children were killed? Where were you at when this happened, when this happened and that happened? Apparent that, apparent that, that Job was looking at God as God being Job's servant to come to his aid at the beckoning need of whatever circumstance Job found himself in. But I do dare to, to, to surmise that, that Job's problem was not that, that, that he had sinned. It was just that he had misplaced who God is. He'd misplaced it. We do the same thing with God. We misplace who God is to, the, to all creation. Why do we do that? Because there's really no definition that we can come up in ourselves of God. I mean, how do you explain God? To call him God. To call him God is a discredit to, to who he is. He's more than. He's more than anything that we could think in our finite brain. He put so much uh, into creation that we can't, we can't even fathom the, 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 the power and ability of God. Uh, like I was talking to James there a while ago, uh, I went back and uh, when I preached that sermon on, on the, the earth and everything, uh, James knew right away how, and I didn't look up my notes for it, but James knew right away how fast the earth spun in his cycle around the sun. 1,100 and something miles an hour. Do you feel like you're going 1,100 and something miles an hour? Huh? 
Only God. Only God. Not man, not Job, not any great patriarch in the Bible has the ability to be God. So why do we treat God as we're the center of the focus? Why do we live our lives as though we have control of our, uh, of our lives? You know, Jesus himself said that we ought to pray like this, that we ought to pray that if it be God's will, we'll do this or do that. You know, if, and what is God's will? What? Okay. That none should be lost, that we should be in good health and prosper as our souls prosper. His will is that none should perish. But he's given his message to man. And he's looking to man to look to him. He's looking to you. Let's get more, more personal with it. He's looking to you to take yourself off of the, the, the authority, the focus, the center part of your life and, and put it on the only one that deserves it. If we could do that, then, then, then the motivation that we'll live our life under is, when can I get back to the house of God? I mean, if we start living our life that way, we'll plan our lives like God, uh, God established it in the beginning. He said, you have six days to work, and then on the Sabbath day, that's mine. But we treat it like it's ours. Come on now. We just had Father's Day, and here we preach the message on, on, on the Father and how that, that, that in, in Isaiah chapter 9 that the Bible says that he's the everlasting Father. And it gave, gives him names, and, and one of those names is Wonderful Counselor. Uh, all, the, uh, all the earth's rule will lay up on his shoulders. You know, and you, I'm surmised, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, uh, but you can read it in Isaiah 9. How that God tells you that uh, you can do it any way you want to, but I'm going to give you a sign. I'm going to come. I'm going to come, and I'm going to show you the way. I'm going to come. God himself said, I'm going to come, and I'm going to show you the way. Now, are you at John 14? John 14, verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Everybody here believes in God? Not little God, but God. You know, the, uh, the Word of God is more powerful than a two-edged sword. But we don't know the Word of God. We hardly even pick up the Word of God. The only word of God we hear or see is people that profess to be children of God or ministers of the word of God. And we see how they live their lives and we surmise God's word because we see, we see things that we don't read. We don't, we don't pursue because we don't know how to sit down. At, at, we don't know how to sit down like Mary sat down at the feet of Jesus and Martha complained. Do you not care that I'm doing all the work? And Jesus told Martha, said, Mary has chosen the better thing. 
you're worried so much about all kinds of things. We find ourselves worried about all kinds of things instead of finding out, uh, uh, finding out, I mean, in the sequence of things here, Jesus had a friend, Lazarus. He, his, he had two sisters, Mary and Martha. Jesus frequent their house in Bethany. And so here the situation is that Lazarus falls sick. And so Lazarus sick, to, to, real sick, Mary and Martha sends a messenger to, to uh, Beth Page, I believe it is, and, and says, bids Jesus come. Because the, the friend you love is dying, is sick. And the scripture says he tarried four more days over there because he knew that Lazarus was going to come back out of the grave because he knew all things. Only God can know all things. So he already, he already knew. And so when, when Jesus came, and Mary tarried. Jesus sent for Mary to come. Martha had came. And, and so here, here he says, uh, he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me shall never die. Huh? I mean, that ought to get your attention right there. I mean, are you dying? I'm telling you. Are you dying or are you on the process of putting this body to the dust where it belongs and living a life that only God can give you? You can't get this life that I'm talking about right now from your mother or father. They were just uh, convenient uh, transport vessels to get you into this place that you could come to know the everlasting Father. I mean, uh, my goodness, my goodness, my, 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 my God, my Savior, my Redeemer, where can I look to besides you? Who can comfort my woundedness who can heal my sickness who can bring to me the peace that passes all understanding the peace that comes at the midnight hour when darkness is falling and the light is fixing to break forth. It always gets darker before the daylight. It's in your word. It's in your Savior. He's not a, I mean, the book of Hebrews says he's not a priest that we can't be, that can't be touched with our infirmities. I mean, you can, you can, you can know who he is. You can know who he is through communicating with him. Oh, you want to go to a doctor and say, oh, I talk to God. And he talks back to me. What's, what's the medicine they want to put you on? Huh? I'm telling you. He talked about that a little bit last night too, and it's in Revelation. It says, that, and, 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 and they resulted and they turned to pharmacia. Huh? I mean, when are we going to shake off this, this unbelief and untrust of God? When, when are we going to decide that we're not the center of the universe? When are we going to decide that, that like God came to Job and said, where were you at when I formed the foundations of the world? Where were you at when, when, when I set the, the, the boundaries of the seas? Huh? Where were we at? Well, we were in Him. 
So we have an eyewitness in us, if we're born again, of the resurrection, the crucifixion, and the creation, and all things, because He is an everlasting source of, of life unto those that believe and trust in Him and know who He is as center of us, our universe. And so uh, Jesus says here in Matthew, in John 14, He says, uh, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Number two, in my Father's house are many mansions. You see, we just ministered on the Father last week. And now here today, we're trying to minister a message of, of being in the Father's house. Jesus is saying here right now, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. That, that's a marriage proposal. I'm telling you, church, that's a marriage proposal. So if you accept the marriage proposal, then, then, then in, in a marriage you don't belong to yourself no more. You belong to the one that proposed and you accept the proposal. You're not your own anymore. You know, Paul went as far as to say that it would be better if you could be like him. Not attaching yourself to another person. Because if you attach yourself to another person, then your responsibility goes to the other person. Jointly with God. You can't leave God out of the equation. He has to be head. He has to be foundational. And if you don't know where the foundation is, the foundation is his word. His head is the, is the information transformed by the anointing of the one and only Christ. He is the anointed one. He's the one that can whisper to you at night and say, this is what I want you to do. That's what I want you to do. He's the one that can whisper to you in your mind's eye, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the shadow of your presence, in the light. You know, there's that battle going on. Darkness and light. And if you know him, then you'll know his voice. And a stranger you won't follow. Huh? Can't get nobody saying much. I mean, I mean, there, there's places that message like this, would, they'd be people standing up shouting and running aisles. I mean, they'd be slapping one another on the back. Did you hear that? Huh? Praise God. Be, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, I'm telling you what now. Uh, I, want, I, want, I want to see excitement about, the, about Him because He's the center of my universe. He's the center of my existence. He's got to be the center of your existence. You can't fall into the trap that Job fell into, that I'll do the right thing, I'll do this right thing, and God's going to do this right thing. It ain't that way. That's not how God's favor goes. God's favor sometimes is not fair. Huh? If we understand God's favor is not fair, if we thought it was fair, we wouldn't even pray for them people that, that are outside of, uh, of what we think is the just and the right thing. We wouldn't even pray for them because we're asking God to do something that ain't fair. We're asking God to have favor on somebody that's a murderer, a liar, a thief, but yet neglecting the aborted baby. Got quiet.
Go to prepare a place. Verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. It ain't waiting on me to arrive. It ain't, I'm not waiting on you to arrive. It'd be good if you get here. It'd be good if you understood the Bible and the the main thing of what I'm telling you is that God said you got six days to do your labor, but the seventh day is mine. If you don't understand the seventh day, then you're not going to prepare yourself on the first day to make sure that the seventh day is what you need to do because, because the seventh day is God's. And God is the creator. God is the giver of life. We came out of God. We were in his book of life whenever, before he began the beginning. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, we need to put this priority in our lives, church. If we don't put this priority in our lives that you're hearing today, then this church is going to stay minimal. Minimal at at most. I mean, I have preached this, I've preached here for several years, and very rarely, very, very, very rarely do I ever get a comment on the sermons. It's like nobody hears. It's like the only thing they hear is what they want to hear. I'm not, I'm not preaching serenades and I'm not preaching for entertainment. I've never felt like I was doing that. If I was trying to entertain somebody, I'd expect a payday. That's what entertainers do, isn't it? That's not what Jesus done. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. Huh? He came to serve. But nobody wants to come to the table. Nobody wants to come to the table. They 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 wait and say, well. It don't fit my schedule, and it ain't about me. So why should I go? You know, I tend to, me and Judy, when I got saved, October the, the 12th, 1986, me and Judy attended the church that we attended for 11 years. I'd taken a, a, a position as the Sunday school superintendent, and, and my job was to stay in the back and count the people, see how many people was here and everything. And, and over the years, 11 years of not missing many services, maybe a handful of services over 11 years, I didn't hear. I mean, I heard messages, but I didn't feel like they were being preached to me. But I knew that they were being preached for somebody's benefit. But it was my duty, it was my responsibility to do my part. It was my responsibility to be faithful. How can you be, how can you have faith if you're not faithful? And you're not going to be, you're not going to enter into the place prepared for you by Jesus himself if you're not faithful. Because whenever it comes time, and, and your time uh, in this life ends, then he's going to look at you and say, I don't know who you are. I never knew you. I mean, that's your responsibility. It's not my responsibility. How are you going to hear if there's not a preacher? I mean, how are you going to hear if you don't come to hear preaching? Because anointed preaching is what breaks the yokes. 
I mean, if, you ain't, if you're not going, if you're going somewhere and you ain't hearing anointed preaching, you better find somebody where the some place where there is some anointed preaching. I mean, we're out of time. We don't have time for these uh, serenade messages of of what I get out of whatever goes on. I'm not interested in what I get out of what goes on. I'm interested in what he gets out of what's going on with me. And that ought to be your priority. Did you come to the church? Did you come to church today to be served or be to be a servant? Did you come and, and, and uh, pray today? Did you bring your Bible and open it today to, to be ministered to? Or did you come today to minister to people? I mean, we come because we're, our spirits together, uh, uh, a congregation of, of prayers together, weighs a lot more with God than just me sitting praying. Because he didn't say where one gathers in my name, I'm there in the midst, though he is. He said where two or more are gathered. So he includes the, the group because he's no respecter of person. He'll love you just as much as he loves T.D. Jakes. He'll love you just as much as he does Ron Carpenter. He'll love you just as much as he did Billy Graham. He'll love you as much as you love him back. You see that, Jackie said, he loves you more than you can love him back. But you see, if your love is rejecting his love, if your love is focused to, to what you can get, if, if your love is focused to you being center of your universe and God being your servant, then you're going to find yourself maybe a righteous person like Job. The Bible confesses that Job was a righteous man. Hmm. All right, did it, what did I read? All right, uh, did I read verse 4? And whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Okay, so we know that, that Philip said, how do we know the way? How do, I mean, how, I mean, what way are you talking about, Lord? He said, and, and they said, show us the Father. And, and he said, have you been with me so long that you don't know me? So, let me, let me just ask you, what is the way? I'm hearing all kinds of good comments. What's this all about? Okay, wait a minute. What did he become? He became our sacrifice. We don't want to hear that. So what's the way? A sacrifice. What's God expecting us to sacrifice? That we can enter into the Father's house. When are we to do it? Romans 12 says now. We're to offer ourselves a living sacrifice. So, what is the way that God, that Jesus is talking about? He's talking about putting God as the center of our focus and prioritizing on God. If it be God's will on the first day of the week, I'll do this. If it be God's will on the second day, I'll do this. Because every day is the Lord's day. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm too excited. I am too excited to even preach this message. Woo! 
I was going to go into into uh, uh, Luke chapter fifteen, verse seventeen. Luke chapter fifteen, verse seventeen is when 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 the prodigal son came to himself. When he came to himself, the first thing he realized and said to himself is, "In my father's house, there's more than enough." So in my father's house, there's more than enough. So I'm going back barefooted, smelling like a pig, no ring on my finger, no nothing that God had given me to leave with. Do I have any more? But I'm going back and plead that I might just become one of his servants because they're in better condition than I'm in. Be, and, and was his son. And we understand how that God, that the father received him to himself and, and he looked for him every day to return. And God's looking for some of you to return, to come back, to, to go to, to be with, to focus on, to prioritize the father. Because in my father's house, there's more than enough. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh huh. See, uh, we expect to expect rewards for obedience. Whenever we come to a place, I mean, there, there's a shame when you come. That, that's the, the place you come to, to, that you know that you need a Savior. You need someone to give you the victory back because you, you have no victory in yourself. Huh? The victory comes when you're born of God. I mean, you have a temporal life here, but the eternal life is now. Okay, so to come to the shame of disobedience. I don't want to ever be like I was. To come the shame of, of disobedience. To come to realize that place that I was in brought me to an altar. And I don't want to, I realize I don't want to ever be like I was, but to expect the reward for his gift of forgiving my past makes me the focus that ought to be God. And we expect, I mean, we, I mean, I came to that place. It didn't take me long to get there. I mean, about seven months after I came to Christ, I got to listen to a voice on this shoulder saying, saying, uh, you're, you're doing real good. Oh, you're a good Christian now. You ain't, you ain't drank none. You ain't done no drugs. You, you come to church all the time. You, you're strong. You're a good Christian. But <laughs> you ought to show yourself how strong you are. Oh, I fell to that trick. You might have fell to it too. You know, I fell to it one time, and that failure, when I fell to it, that was my, that was my great escape of that temptation. I never fell to it again. But you know why I never fell to it again? Because I remember how ashamed of myself I was when I come to realize what I'd done. And it all became it all came about because I got pride in myself instead of pride in his gift. I've learned over 31 and a half years where my priority is. And I've learned over 31 years that everybody is not going to go with you. I've learned over 31 years that everybody ain't celebrating you. And that's a good thing. Because nobody ought to celebrate me. They ought to celebrate him. It's like we were talking in the beginning. For one to... Uh, for a saint to die in Christ, saved, born again, 
they enter into a great a greater party than they've ever experienced in this side of the world because it's a party thrown by the Lord Jesus Christ and an angelic host that, that supersedes anything we know. And that party goes on for the one that goes on to be with Christ, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord in the Father's house. In the Father's house. You've got to get that in the Father's house. We, we've got, we've got a, a Father that that's went to prepare a place for us. And when, the, when our time comes, He's going to receive us unto Himself. And we ought to make a priority of celebrating that every day of our lives. We ought to start from the seed, and when we leave here, we ought to start from then on to prepare ourselves to come again next week because I got something here today. I want it again tomorrow. I want it again next week. I want it to, to build upon it. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I don't want to know him in, sur sur in a sur sur surface type relationship I want to know him to where I can climb up in his lap and talk to him and listen to him tell me sweet nothings hallelujah I'm telling you he wants to do that with you he wants to love you like you've never been loved before he wants to put crowns and robes upon you he wants to celebrate you Praise God, but we fall into the trap. Deliver us from carnal understanding. We, we, we're, we're satisfied with carnal understanding. Oh, if we do good, it'll be good for us. We'll get to, uh, this and that. But I'm not satisfied with carnal understanding. It stops us from understanding the spiritual truth. Only God can build a house of God. Only God can build a house of God. You know what he's talking about? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. It should be, I go to prepare you a place. That went over your head. Jesus went on in chapter 14 of John says, I'm not going to leave you void. I'm going to send one like me. But the one coming like me is going to be different than me because the one coming like me is me in the Spirit. And he'll come in. He'll come in, rearrange the furniture. He'll consecrate things. He'll consecrate things. You know, the, the hardest thing for him to consecrate is the eyes. Because there's a gate to eternity and the temporal. We see. You see, have you ever been to a magician, a, a, a trickster's uh, thing, and, and, and they do these hand things and everything, and you think that the, 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 the peanut is under this shell? Huh? You see, I brought a guitar up here. Where'd it go? No, Okay. This is the church's guitar, but I could say it's mine for uh, a little example's sake. I could say that this guitar is mine, and I could have it in my house sitting over, over in the corner and everything. And, and yeah, that's a pretty guitar. I could pick it up and, and maybe look at it and... I don't know how to play it. But Jerry could come in and pick up that guitar and make it talk. 
You see, it could be my guitar, but I never owned it. Jerry owned the talent to own it. And so, if you get a gift from God called salvation, and you don't own it, you can have it sitting in the corner of your house, or you can put it in the, in the back window of your car, or you can lay it on the dresser at your house in the bedroom, and if you don't never own it, if you don't ever, if you don't know how to to operate in it, to 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 perfect it, to 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 bring it to life, then you don't own it. It's that way with salvation. It's that way with the gift of God. See, the gift of God is forever. But the gift of Satan is a counterfeit lie. And we follow a counterfeit lie. You know, I want you to turn to, to, I want you to, turn to Isaiah chapter 66. And I'm going to close with this. I'm trying to be done before three. Isaiah 66. Uh, sometime, Isaiah 66, you know, uh, we were preaching on uh, Psalms 90. Psalms 90 verse 10 says, you know, that a generation is 70 years. And so here, here if you go on uh, back to the beginning of Psalms 90, it says that God, God, uh, uh, brings you to destruction. You know, God brings you to destruction. You can build and build and build and can come to destruction because your foundation's wrong. <clears throat> you see, we know, how many knows the Word of God? Do you, you you say uh, I'm pretty I'm pretty pretty up in what the Bible says, huh? You want to own the Bible? You want to own prophecy? You want to you want to know that we're in the last days? I'm telling you. I'm telling you you may we may not have time to get home today. I'm telling you. You need to start today. You need if if you started a long time ago, I mean, you could I I've I've seen people that that have fallen in fallen in the ditch and and you think, man, they've been married twenty years, and he never come to the realization that she was the one. I mean, you've been in this thing thirty one years and you've not realized that he's really the one. You've not came no further than a baby status to, to, to read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. Huh? And that's as far as you want to go? Come on, church, come on. Look at 66, verse 4. Isaiah 66, verse 4. It says, I also will choose their delusions. Remember Second Thessalonians? Because they loved not the truth. He had turned them over to strong illusions, delusions. 
Here it says it again in Isaiah 66, 4. And I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, you didn't hear me. It says, because when I called, none answered. When I spake, they did not hear. There's a requirement. There's a requirement to have salvation. Salvation is something that's a free gift, but you have to own it. You have to come to the responsibility of it. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly because God will choose your delusion if you take it lightly. I'm telling you. When I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes and chose that which I delighted not. Keep, keep your place there in Isaiah 66. I want to show you something that uh, I didn't really know either till last night when Mike taught this. Uh, what's this word, Rick? Enviro pig. He he used that in uh, in his message last night. You ever heard of Enviro pig terminology? Never heard of Enviro pig. Okay. Here's a paper that I printed out. He, he told me, I said, can I get a copy of that? He said, well, if you want to, you can go to the Internet, type it in, type, it, type that word in, and you'll have a plethora of information. So I printed off a little something here. And so the, the farmers in, uh, in Canada, they raise Hampshire pigs. They raised these certain type of pigs, and they were having a problem because the, the waste that the pigs put out was not biodegradable. And, and so it was, hindering, uh, it was hindering their farming process of raising pigs that were healthy. So they started researching uh, how they could fix the problem with pigs. So here's what they came to the conclusion of. It was that they would take a mouse and a pig, and they would take the DNA and the, and the, uh, they'd take, take the DNA of the mouse and the, the uh, germs of the mouse and inject it in the pigs and create a pig that's, that's, that's waste or poop wasn't so gassy. To say it a different way. So here they, they came up with this technology and they started doing it in 2010 in Canada. You're welcome to this paper. And why were they doing it? To have a better pig for humans to consume. So they're tampering, just like Enoch said they did, the fallen angels did with creation. I mean, here it is right here. What was that word again? Enviro pig. And you've seen the, you've seen the evolutionists. They come from a, a monkey to up, more upright. And, well, right here's a little scale from a mouse. A mouse to G. M O pig. We well, think, what in the world has that got to do with preaching a sermon? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> tell us, 
I, I'm glad you asked. Did, did everybody understand what, what I was just giving you an illustration of? <clears throat> All right, in Isaiah 66, Isaiah 66, verse 17. This is proof that you know that we're in the last days. Okay? They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens. Huh? We are gardeners. My sister's a good gardener, but she ain't mixing no mouse DNA with tomatoes. Huh? Behind one tree in the mist. Wonder what tree that is. Would you think the knowledge of good and evil? Huh? What do we say about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Taking the determination of good and evil from God. And putting it in our hands. Remember I told you last week? Give you a little scenario. Gave you a little uh, example. So uh, God said, all right, you don't want me to determine good and evil. You want to do it yourself? And, and so you go down through there and you look see a pig wallowing in a trough, in a slop pit, in its own waste, sty. And you say, oh, well, that's nasty. Well, you determined that it was evil. So there you go. That's evil to you. See the scenario? Okay. It says, behind the tree, uh, but behind the tree, it don't say trees, it says tree in the mist, eating swine's flesh and the abomination of the mouse. Huh? Uh, you want me to read again? Read, read it. You got a microphone, Rick? Read, read it. You might read better than I can and, and emphasize <laughs> a little bit. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh, and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. Shall be consumed together? I mean, what are they doing? What are they doing to bring a better food product to the grocery store for you to put on your table? I'm telling you, this ought to get your attention. I mean, you can't do it your way and get by with it. That's right. You can't just say, you can't just say, God, God lo is love and he understands. I fully intended to move out. I wasn't married. I was shacking up. Yeah, I lied. Yeah, I said that about my brother or my sister. Huh? It don't work. You can only justify yourself in your own eyes. You see, the Bible says that God winked at sin at one time. But when Christ, when Christ's blood was shed, then he required all men and women and children to repent. Repent means stop doing it. Stop doing the unjust thing. Stop touching the unclean thing. Sanctify. What does sanctification mean? Set apart. Sanctification means set apart. Sanctify thyself 
holy unto God. I can't do it for you. I barely can do it for myself. And I fall short in my own strength. But when I get up in the morning, he's the most foremost thing in my life. My focus from the seedening, from when I leave this, this building, my focus is to serve God with all my might. My focus is to serve God with all my might, and I suggest you do the same. And if you are not doing the same, and if you've, and, and, and if you've heard something today, and, and you judge yourself, right now is the time to repent. Before the sun goes down, repent. Is it easy? It ain't easy. If it was easy, everybody would have already done it. It ain't easy, church. It's not easy to realize the shame of disobedience. And you see, shame came over me of my disobedience, and it helped me not to ever do drugs again. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have done it had it not become a shame to me. You know what hurt me the worst that day? It's on a Saturday. I was ashamed of myself for doing what I'd done. But when I'd finally come to the end of myself that day on a Saturday evening and it was about getting sundown, I had the guy that was driving the van take me back home. And when I got out of the, out of the van that day, Walked up to the front door, opened the front door of the house, stepped inside the living room. The very moment I stepped through that threshold, my wife came through the kitchen threshold and was standing face to face with me. And I saw the expression on her face. The expression on her face was hurt. The expression on her face was, what have you done? And just as fast as I saw that expression on her face, I saw her head drop and her disappear back into the kitchen. I couldn't do nothing. I couldn't say nothing. All I could do was work out my shame and my sorrow for over a week before I came to terms with, it's not over yet. I came to terms with saying, all right, I messed up. I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to do better. I'm more determined now. Because I like to see a smile on my wife's face. When mama's happy. Huh? Me and you are to learn something there. <laughs> right. Yep, it's true. He takes things that are bad and turns them around to good. He can take your bad circumstance today. It may not turn around overnight. But he does know the intent of your heart. He does know the effort that you're going to put in sanctifying yourself wholly unto him. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We ask you to...
touch everyone that's gathered here today. The Word of God's true and every man's a liar. Your Word's going to come to pass. It is coming to pass. It's evidence that we're at the end of the Gentile dispensation. Lord, we're at the end of the grace period that we can get in as a free gift in Christ. Lord, I pray that you save the lost. I pray you heal the sick. I pray, I pray for provisions, but I'll, I most of all pray for made up minds. Made up minds to love you, not for what we can get, but because you're God. In Jesus' name. Men, I want you to come up here and pray for Jerry. Jerry's going to UT tomorrow through the day to see if he can get on the list for a kidney transplant. Tomorrow. He's got to go to dialysis Tuesday. Is that right? Or is it vice versa? Okay. He's got to go to dialysis tomorrow, Tuesday, to UT Hospital to see if he can get on their transplant list. I'm believing God for his success. Whether it's him healing him right now, whether it's healing him through a kidney transplant, that God's will be done and that he's going to walk into victory. Praise the Lord. I want to remember this gentleman, Everett uh, uh, Keaton also. Oh, I'm sh sorry. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I mean, you believe God can, can work this out for Jerry? Absolutely. Praise the Lord. Father, we just put it in your hands right now for favor for Jerry. Lord, not only with the kidneys, but the diabetes, the amputation, the, his whole health, Lord, I pray that, that he... As his soul prospers, that his whole physical being would prosper. Lord, he has the victory in Christ Jesus as his Savior. Lord, there's, there's a, a, a place prepared. John 14, there's a place prepared for Jerry right now, Lord, to walk in. Health, uh, a healthy spiritual man, and, and a healthy body. Lord, we give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus' name we pray. Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, somebody pray with Monty. You, okay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, if you don't, if you're, if you're, if every heart and soul's at ease and you're in peace and you're at liberty. I'll, I hope to see you next Sunday. Start preparing yourself to be here. And bring somebody with you. All right? Huh?